Hello, everybody. Welcome to another Professional Genealogist React stream. I'm Jerry Ross, a genie blogger, and it is wonderful to have you all here today. I know we're getting started um, a little bit later than usual. This is the latest I've ever gotten one of these streams started. I've done, I think, 4 o'clock, but 4.30 uh, is a little later. Um, I do see we've uh, got a good amount of people already coming into the stream, so thank you, thank you all for being here. Uh, we have Tasha coming in from Minnesota, Carlos on Facebook coming in from uh, London. Hello, Carlos. Um, we have Drea coming in from Massachusetts. Boy, I have a doozy of a genealogy week. Oh, ah. Boy, have I had a doozy of a genealogy week already. Yesterday, I found out that Jed Match's police opt-out didn't mean opting out of missing person stuff. Yeah, that's right. Uh, with Jed Match's uh, terms of service, if you're opted out of law enforcement stuff, uh, that doesn't mean that you're opted out of um, doe cases, so unknown human remains. Um, Weeping Scorpion coming in from Faroe Islands. Hey, how you doing? Good to have you as always. We have Gina coming in from Lubbock, Texas, home of Buddy Holly. Yes, and uh, we just the other day had the anniversary of the day the music died when uh, Buddy Holly, uh, Richie Valens, and the Big Bopper, and um, I forgot who the fourth guy was. Uh, he was... I forgot his name, um, but yeah, that that uh, that was just the other day. Richie Valens, when I was growing up, was my favorite musician. Like I was obsessed with him. I was really in the fifties and sixties music. Um, Eve coming in, hello, coming in from Ontario. Wonderful to have you as always. Monica coming in from Sweden. We have Sandy coming in from North Carolina. We have Maven coming in. Man, WikiTree does have some primitive options for names. Uh, yeah, like I say always, I love Jeannie's naming stuff. We got Charlie. Hey, Charlie. Everyone uh, give a thumbs up in chat for Charlie for uh, or give a C in chat <laughs> for Charlie uh, for being so uh, so helpful with everything. And I'm sure we'll probably see. Yeah, we see Blackberry Rose is in here, too. Our newest mod. So uh, everyone give a, a a B for Blackberry Rose in chat. <laughs> uh, Eve just had a new 71 cents Morgan match pop up on my heritage last night. Had to build this tree back two more generations to discover he's a fourth cousin match looking for other possible links. That's awesome that you found the, the uh, possible connection there. Um, Louise coming in. Hello from Peru. Submitted some questions to the subreddit, but they haven't gotten much love. Hope they can still be answered. Yeah, I mean, I'm hoping to get to as many questions as possible. Um, you know, and I do do the, the upvoting system to try to kind of get ones that people really like, but I will try to get ones that are further back in time so we can slowly but surely get all of them. Um, we have Chroma Prime coming in from Kansas City, Missouri, representing the Twitch crowd. We've got few people on every uh, platform, although YouTube's our number one. <laughs> Uh, we have Sharp Lisa coming in from Niagara Falls in uh, Canada. Or I guess just Niagara, not actual Niagara Falls, but that's where the falls are, right? Uh, we have Stig coming in from Oslo. Wonderful to have you again. We have more of the Twitch fam. Quist, Christy Love 3. Hello from Texas. Thank you for joining, Christy. We have Barb Class and Heck coming in from Canada. We have Monica. Toby Keith died today. Yeah, I think he died real, real early in the morning too. Yeah, sorry to, sorry to hear that. Uh, Charlie, he was only seventeen when he died in that plane. Yeah, yeah, for Richie Valens, he was seventeen years old. So, oh, I see lots of C's and <laughs> some C's, some B's. <laughs> um, oh, Carmen's here. Hello from Nebraska. Uh, we have Jacqueline coming in. Hello there from Washington State. And then uh, we have some more people coming in. Fisherman, hello. Evan Saul, hello from Fredericksburg, Virginia. I'm working on my thesis for my history degree and using one of my ancestors who signed a labor contract with several freedmen in 1866. I'm looking at race relations in VA. Very, very interesting. Very cool that you're coming in from Fredericksburg, Virginia. I actually used to go to a uh, camp not too far from Fredericksburg. Wow, I just noticed I was really out of the frame there. Um so, yeah, if anyone's ever heard of Camp Friendship, I don't remember how far away that was from Fredericksburg, but my uncle had a, uh, a lake house uh, around that area at a place called Lake of the Woods, and I used to go there all the time growing up. Um, so, as usual, let's go ahead and share that screen. Um, some housekeeping sort of things. I will be answering questions from the 
read it. I already have scoped out like two or three different ones that I thought would be great. I will be keeping my eye on chat, trying to answer questions there. I can't guarantee I'll answer questions though. Sometimes I miss some, uh, but if you do a super chat for one, it kind of pins it. So I am able to answer that. Uh, but I do guarantee if you do a super chat, I will answer those. Um, plus it helps me out in supporting the channel. So I do have a few already kind of uh, scoped out and I think, yeah, I think this was the first one because we kind of started up here. So right now I'm doing the top of all time. And interestingly enough, the three that I've scoped out all were kind of of various points. So this one is a little bit older, but brick wall, oh, let me make sure... That's large enough. I want everyone to be able to see it well. I know I had some people uh, last time saying that they were watching from their phones and it was really hard to read. So I know I know it's it, it's kind of difficult, but hopefully this is good. Hello, I have been dealing with a bit of a brick wall for a while now, and I'm trying to come at it from the DNA side and could use some help or tips. My maternal third great grandmother is a woman named Melinda Barrett. Her father is James, and she has five children with no known father from the records who all have the last name of Barrett like their mother. Interestingly, Melinda's sister, Melissa Emmeline, has six children with her last name and no known father as well. Ancestry wants James to be the father of Melinda's, Melinda's children badly and also recommends him on through lines. There are a lot of trees that make the mistake of a assuming James is the father of Melinda's children because they all lived together. And in 1870, there was no relationship listed on the census. The proof as to why ancestry suggests him as a potential parent seems to just be all the trees that have him as the parent. Yeah, this is a common difficulty with ancestry. I've considered that James is the father of Melinda as well as her five children. And maybe by extension, the father of Melissa Emmeline and her six children as well that set of my or that side of my mother's family has a lot of kissing cousins my question is can i use the dna match to somehow confirm this information is there any way to figure out if james is both daddy and granddaddy or find out more about who the father of melinda's children might be i'm just not sure where to go from here with this brick wall so hopefully someone has some insight thank you and there were some comments down below. And the one that I wanted to mention was uh, our good old buddy, Matt, who I haven't seen hopped in here, but he's our other mod. Um, and uh, he wrote, I wouldn't just assume that the children having no known father means that their grandfather is also their father. Through lines just shows you what other trees have. And I assume from what you've said, people saw the census that shows no relationship first and then jump to conclusions despite what the earlier census has showed. This is, is the key point right here is not only is there a big question mark, you know, her, her father is the father of her children. I mean, it's not impossible, but it's certainly very questionable. And especially if there's six children, I'd imagine that of those six, if that were the case, there'd probably be a lot of health issues. Um, and so that's a big issue is that basically, you know, is it something that we can kind of disprove? And for one, looking at the other censuses, is, as, as Matt mentions, shows that this is not right. And it shows that it's her, her father that's her father, not the father of the children. Doesn't necessarily confirm that it's not. But knowing where the error probably is coming from and that through lines, the only record that they are giving you is based on what other trees have. These are kind of the key signs to show when you're dealing with an error that's been propagated so much that even the system thinks that might be the case. And this is a big issue. A lot of people have with ancestry, especially in the sense that if someone has incorrect information that is messing up your through lines, you can't get, you can't change that in any way. They have to change their stuff. There's no way in through lines at this point to be able to go in and say, no, this is not correct. This, you should not be recommending this or something like that. The best thing that there is at this point is just leaving comments, which I think in a few other streams I've done, we've 
seen a few of those. Um, but that's kind of a key point. So to continue, it's much more likely that she had perhaps been a little more promiscuous. That would be acceptable in the times. Or perhaps the father was someone of high repute or status and didn't want it known. Or perhaps she just didn't know the science behind getting pregnant and made the same mistake several times. In my opinion, all of these are much more likely than incest, but it is unfortunately possible that was the case. Now, one of the big questions here is, is there a way of actually showing it? And technically, there is a way that you might be able to figure out if the ch children are truly the uh, descendants of the father or, or the, the children of the father, because you need to or what you would need to do is you would need to do Y chromosome testing. So first, you would need to get a male patrilineal descendant of James or if you possibly know, you know, brothers of his who have those type of descendants or, you know, further back, but preferably if James has other children, which I know you mentioned two daughters, but he, I, I don't know. If, oh yeah. Her father is James and she has, oh wait, no, you don't mention how many children he had. I don't think, I don't, either way, if he had sons who had sons who had sons and those males are living, you can get them Y chromosome tested and then, getting the children of Melinda, any of the males that may have had that, you know, male line continuing where you have them Y DNA test. And if James is truly the father of those children, those descendants should have the, the same Y chromosome. Um, in fact, with it being that close, they should have it pretty spot on, um, you know, maybe one or two genetic vary or differences at most, I would guess. Um, but that's the way that would be the best to prove it. Um, the next best thing is, you know, doing some sort of uh, uh, autosomal DNA testing with older relatives and trying to get close enough with enough that maybe you can tell it, but you're still dealing with the issue of these grand or, you know, James's grandchildren are going to be descended from him, whether or not he's the father. So the only difference is if he's the father, the DNA amount shared should be different than if he's just the grandfather. And so I don't know exactly how much that would skew things, but I mean, presumably, you know, if he is the father and the grandfather, those children would have 75% of his DNA about because 50% of the DNA is coming from him. 50% of the DNA is coming from Melinda, but then 50% of D Melinda's DNA is going to be from her father. So it would equate to 75%. So, and I think that was what someone mentioned down here. Yeah. Yeah. yeah what they mentioned. So, um, yeah, and actually let's give some, let's give some thumbs uh, or upvotes for them to do that. So there, there are some ways to possibly do it, but, it's going to be very, very difficult. And, um, you know, you're up against a lot. I think the, <clears throat> the Y chromosome way would probably be the most precise in being able to tell. And, you know, especially, you know, you do one Y chromosome for a descent, a male descendant that, you know, for sure is from James, you do a Y chromosome from a male descendant, that you know, for sure is from one of Melinda's sons. And then, you know, if they don't match at all, you know, okay, well, it can't be there is i mean i the one thing i should say with that is there is always the question of there could be another npe event somewhere in the line so you know you might think it's james's great great grandson that you're testing but really it's you know james's grandson thought he had a son with this woman but it was some other guy's son so there's always that other question to have in mind so um let's go ahead and do reviewed and this question was answered during the live stream. Professional, blah, 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 blah. February 6th, 2024. Still getting used to the whole 2024 thing. Okay. So, all right. So, yeah, that was a that was a quick one. Um, let's check chat real quick. Um, 
Okay, we have John's here. Good to see you, John. Another uh, co- uh, another very familiar name to see in the uh, in the chat. Uh, Maven says false info for an unknown father spreads fast through trees, but the correct father being found would not spread. Misinformation spreads faster in this field too. Yeah, it's 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 kind of like a fire with information and genealogy, in that you know, once someone puts something out there, if somebody starts copying it it you know it just can exacerbate and that's one of the reasons why a lot of people like myself are very confident in how collaborative trees can overcome that sort of thing in that you know if you have the proper tools to lock the trees when the correct information is there or you know something is changed that other trees often don't have and people are going to want to try to change it it can be locked and so then you have the proper information so, you know, that's like one of the big benefits with Genie and WikiTree and all of those. You find a mistake, you can fix it. Um, whereas, you know, you find a mistake on Ancestry, your best bet is either messaging and trying to get them to change it or leaving a comment. And unless they actually change it, it's still going to mess a lot with the system. So. Was this the one? No, this wasn't the one. Yeah, because I, I guess we'll just kind of go, go through this real quick. Why does my daughter has ethnic, ethnicities neither I nor my wife has? And this is one that I think I I might have answered this one before from because I know we've answered from OK Flamingo because uh, there was that one stream where I was like, they're getting all these different ones answered. Um, but I mean, without even really looking through too much with everything, um, yeah, I mean, we see they are a big mix of everything. The basic answer with why would a daughter get ethnicities that neither you or your wife has could be a couple of things. Um, the first answer I know is not the case here because I can see right off the bat that you're testing on the same database. But one thing that a lot of people won't recognize is that, you know, daughter tests on 23andMe, parents test on MyHeritage, and then they're like, what's going on here? Obviously, that's not the case here. Um with this here, what's going on is it's a few things. Number one, it's the errors of the DNA not being phased. And I think this is, yeah, this is, this is my heritage. So I don't believe, I don't know if my heritage has a phasing tool. I think maybe they do. I need to, I need to look back at a lot of this stuff. I haven't done phasing in a, in a, in a little while uh, on my heritage if they have it. But basically what phasing is, is the idea that here, let's actually get some images pulled up for us so we can get a good idea of things. And um, as I say that, I'll kind of try to explain it. But basically what phasing is, is just when you're looking at your DNA, you have two pairs or you have a base, you know, you have a pair of, of <laughs> alleles. I you can tell how much of a non-science guy I am who's really learned all this stuff just from firsthand. So it's like, I know exactly what I'm talking about. I just don't know the proper terminology sometimes. But basically you have, you know, at your DNA, you have base pairs. So you have a pair at each spot. So we have a pair here, 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 here. But we don't know which one is from mom and which is from dad because one's from mom, which one's from dad. And so that's a difficulty in figuring this stuff out. And so when they're trying to come up with how you're matching the people, they're going through your DNA and trying to figure out what the segments are. So it could be A, G, T, A, you know, it could bounce back and forth. Like the way we have it here, the order is just kind of just, they just put it together. It's like, there's definitely two there, but we don't know if the, this side is truly one and this is one. So then it, let's say it goes through, the system to be read and they come up with this, but in reality, this is actually a misread. Um, and so, sorry, I'm getting messages people. <laughs> and so with this misread, then it's going to match it against people. Or in this case, it's going to be matching, you know, trying to figure out where's that misread tying to into the uh, population groups. And so your daughter may be getting these misreads where it's a combination of your DNA and your wife's DNA, basically. And they think it's something else. 
Um, so when you have the ability to phase, which like I said, I need to double check if my heritage does. Let me see if, does my heritage, I don't, let me see, message. Okay, that's not about that. <laughs> I wasn't sure if it was one of my buddies watching the stream texting me about that. Um, yeah, so if they do phase, what it does then is it takes one parent, or if you have both parents, even better, and it makes it where it winds everything up. So in this case, we phase it, and then all of a sudden, after phasing, we see that this segment they read will actually... The C was a G, the T was an A, the A was a T here, the T was an A here, and the A was a T here, but all the other stuff was correct. So that means that these five spots, those were all uh, uh, markers from the, the other parent being read with the one parent. Hopefully that makes sense. Do you can tell one of the reasons why I'm very... <laughs> I, I'm very uh, particular with when I edit my videos. It's like I have to write it out to word it well. Um, but yeah, that's that's basically the answer here. Um, and then there's other there's other reasons that can cause misreads in the DNA. Obviously, like there's a one percent margin of error with DNA tests. Just in in reading each, you know, in reading each spot, there's a one percent margin of error, and they're reading seven hundred thousand spots. About they call them single nucleotide polymorphism. So single nucleotide. So that's a nucleotide, and then polymorphism. So basically. There's kind of like a, a, a standard DNA um, that is compared against that. If you have that mutation, that mutation is meaningful. Okay. <laughs> Give me a second. My allergies are kicking in. Oh, I kind of move that. There we go. So, uh, ah, my cousin Desiree coming in from the Netherlands. I was able to meet her when uh, I went out to Amsterdam. Uh, we were able to walk uh, walk around Amsterdam. So that was that was really cool. So great to have you here. And I heard you got to do a big meetup with a bunch of other uh, cousins that came into town. So um, Dennis asks, I thought or says, I thought A could only pair with T not A with A. So I believe it's A with T, but then also it can be what's known as homozygous. So basically the same uh, allele at the same spot. So AA or TT or CC or GG. But I believe if you're if you see an A, you're either going to see it paired up with another A or a T. Or if it's a C, you're going to see it paired up with a G or another C. Um, so yeah. Let's see. Matt Potter says, do you think that when you confirm a match and link them to your tree on ancestry, they mark the matching DNA is correctly phased. And the more the matches you link up, the more accurate the matching is. Um, I'm not sure if they do that. It'd be kind of cool if they did. If that was a feature, I would hope, hope that they would give. Well, I mean, I, if that is a feature, I would hope that they would make it more advanced in that you could set specific segments to be higher confidence or lower confidence. Because like for endogamous populations like mine, when I've done DNA painting with cousins, I know how they're related. I can sometimes be able to see some segments that'll be, you know, like the small seven centimorgan segments that don't match up with anything else and, and seem to be, you know, seem to be part of that, you know, the, the little pieces that are coming from really distant shared ancestry. That's part of why endogamous populations have the issue of exacerbated DNA. Um, so I don't know if they necessarily do that. As far as I know, I think the, the, most of the sites only use parents, uh, when doing phasing, there might be, there might be with one of the gen match tools. I wonder if there's a way to do phasing without doing a parent. Um, I mean, technically you could kind of do something like that with Lazarus. If you don't have the parent tested, I wonder if you could like create a Lazarus profile for a parent and then somehow use that to phase it. Um, but that's, I, I don't even know if that's possible. Um, but I don't think they do that. 
I don't think they do that. But that's basically, in a sense, what you're describing is just kind of them doing automatic DNA painting. Because with DNA painting, you paint where you're matching on the chromosomes. And then once you've had enough matches lined up, you can be very confident of, okay, well, this part of my DNA is coming from this ancestor. And this part of my DNA is coming from this ancestor. And you can do what Lazarus does after time in basically making reconstructed genomes creating DNA profiles of deceased ancestors where you just use how all of you and your matches match up to be able to figure that out. So, um, cause with phasing, I mean, I don't know. Yeah. I, I, yeah. It'd be interesting to see if they have something like that, but it is certainly an interesting uh, thing to mention. Uh, welcome Rosie. Thank you for jumping in. And another cousin of mine, Catherine Michael, who I think Catherine, you're also a cousin to Desiree. Uh, so, um, you know, all of us Dutch Jews are cousins to each other, basically. Um, Donna's here. Uh, welcome from sunny Detroit. Um, and then John asks, has there been any instances where the DNA matches have been predicted to be on one side but turned out to be on the other side, paternal versus maternal. And I can say definitely in my experience with, um, you know, family tree DNA, I think was one of the earliest ones to roll out a paternal and maternal sort of phasing, which actually family tree DNA does kind of what Matt was saying before, where as you start to connect more of your matches into the family tree DNA family tree that you have, then it's going to start phasing your matches to paternal or maternal. Um, I don't know if it phases it in the sense of change, you know, rereading segments to readjust how you're matching people, but it does at least put you into maternal or paternal camps. Now Ancestry has that feature as well, but at least from an endogamous standpoint, I can tell you 100% that it is off a lot for that. Um, as for non-endogamous populations i don't know how often it may be off but you know all of these things i think have some sort of a margin of error with it so probably going to be off at least a little um oh uh, <laughs> two two folks saying that they're getting ads right now yeah i have i apparently i found out and i i have it pulled up there's uh youtube studio has their own streaming sort of software thing where I can manage the stream and apparently I can start my own ads from there. Um, but I guess I have to, I guess I have to adjust it or I don't know. To, to stop. Um, oh, ironically and sardonically you're late again, but started this stream super late. We've only been going for just under a half hour. So you, you'll be here for a while. <laughs> so, okay. So we answered that one. Um, so yeah, this was one that wasn't really a question, but I thought this was such a cool one. And Enrique 3D, who someone that is very familiar on our streams and in the Genie Vlogger community, I'm Brazilian and my family, to my knowledge, is Portuguese, indigenous, and African, average Brazilian experience. And also we have a little of Italian, my grandma, great grandma. In the documental area, I painted the percentages accordingly to my latest non-Brazilian Brazilian ancestor, or in the case of attested indigenous Brazilian origins, I marked the percentage correspondent. My results varies a little, but on average, they are quite consistent. One thing that is striking me out is how much Northwestern European I got across all platforms. To my knowledge, I have zero knowledge about British, French, German, or Dutch ancestors, although I have a great, a six times great grandpa that was Franco Swiss. As a Brazilian, I'm quite white, by the way. <laughs> So we have the, and we're going to, oh, it's not really, oh, that's right. Okay, perfect. So we can do it that way. So does it get larger that way? I just need to see how it's coming out for you all. And that did not make it any better for you all. That probably made it worse. Made it larger on my end, but... <laughs> right there and then yeah i guess we'll just have to do it this way so the first one is gen era which is a really interesting one makes sense that they took it because this is based in brazil 
And my understanding, this is actually a test where, you know, most consumer autosomal DNA tests like MyHeritage, Ancestry, 23andMe, they are testing about 700,000 SNPs. So those are the DNA markers. And with Genera, I don't remember exactly how many, but I want to say they're only testing about 60,000 SNPs or so. So they're testing just a little under 10% of what other tests are doing. So that's going to adjust things a little. But um, this is actually one of the rare times I'm seeing Genera results. So we're getting less than 2% East Africa, 4% Monde, 6% Maghreb, so Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, less than 2% Levant, 39% Iberia, 6% Sardinia, 30% Western Europe, Germany, France, Netherlands, and North Italy. So that's their the big chunk of the Northwestern they were talking about 5% Balkans, less than 2% Caucasus, 5% Amazon and less than 2% Andean. And then going along now, here's the, my heritage results. And I guess let's kind of be able to see. So the African here is being read into Kenya, Nigeria, and then North Africa. So that's kind of a combination of all of this in a sense. Although I don't know if I'd really line up the Maghreb as much with this. Um, although I don't know if that's exactly what they're going for here with lining all of those up. But it, certainly the Kenya, the Kenya and Nigeria line up with this uh, Monde in East Africa. Um, so that makes sense. And then the Maghreb and Levant equating to the North Africa and possibly also being part of... Uh, um, the Iberia that's over here, because over here the Iberia is 8.7% and 42.4% Italy. So a lot of the Iberians go in there. So that's the issue of Southern European DNA. Then we have 0.8% England, 13.7% Ireland, Scotland, and Wales, 7% Balkans, 9.4% Mesoamerican and Andean. So still pretty similar, but just slightly, slightly different. Now we get living DNA, which this is going to be an interesting one because they go for super nuanced uh, um, Northwestern breakdown, especially in uh, England, Scotland, Wales, Ireland. Um, so we have now 1.7% uh, clearing, clearling, um, pronouncing that terribly, I'm sure. 6.8% Northern Morocco, 1.8% cops, 3.6% North turkey um yeah so i get yeah that's that's lining up pretty much 28.3 percent west iberia 12.3 percent south italy 9.9 percent .9 north italy and now we get that really interesting breakdown of the 19.6 percent great britain and ireland which is then broken down 9.6 percent east anglia 2.3 percent devon 1.7 southeast england cornwall lincolnshire south central england and ireland and then about 6% Mesoamerica. And then Genome Link, uh, one that I'm not, I have never used really. 4.8% uh, Africa, 2.9% other, 19.2% other European, 34.6% Northwestern Europe, 14.4% East Europe, 23.1% Amerindian, and 1% Asian. Uh, so yeah, you can see how unnuanced that is. Is, uh, compared to the other ones uh, mundo dna not familiar with this at all i feel like i've seen mundo um in gen match here and there but yeah mundo mundo dna so okay so it's one of the upload sites not a uh not an actual ordering and doing the DNA site. So, okay. So they're getting 0.11%. They're giving a lot of small percentages here. Nigeria, Yoruba, 0.64% Gambia, 1.63 Mindinka, 2.16 Bantu, 3.57% uh, Kenya, 3.3 and Luya, 3.3% uh, Mozambique. 28.29 Iberian, 13.9 Italy with Tuscany. So that's kind of uh, more northern Italy. That's actually where a lot of my family was in the uh, from it, the Italy. Ugh. My Italian ancestry, I mean, not real Italian. It was 
you know, Jews living in Italy, uh, but in Livorno. Um, 10.10% Sardinian, 2.27 French, 12.96 England and Scotland, 11.7 Finland, 5.6 Colombian, broadly American 2.3, and then 1.32 Asian. And then, how many? Okay, we have three more. All right, so let's look at the Tommy Jen and then My Family Tree DNA. Wait, My Family Tree DNA? Is that. I just want to make sure that they're just they're not just trying to say family tree DNA and not my heritage. I don't know. I don't. I don't know if uh, let's let me. I haven't even looked at chat. Let me see what if anyone said anything chat wise. Uh, uh, yeah, no one's saying anything. Okay. Um, yeah, so I don't know. I guess we'll just uh, we'll just presume it's either my heritage or family tree DNA. I, I, I'm not sure which. We'll see. Maybe actually, you know what? We'll probably be able to tell by the names of this, the things in the results. And I think it's going to be family tree DNA because my heritage has Sephardic Jewish, but I don't think they call it just Sephardic Jewish. I think they call it like Sephardic Jewish, and then have some other thing with it. Uh, well, let's actually. Let's Take a look. FTDNA population groups. Um, yeah, are they on my origins four? Or is it still my origins three? FTDNA, my origins. All right, well, we'll just do this guy okay so okay so are these are just okay let's see if we can find the sephardic Unless they define it. Here, let's. <laughs> okay, they just call it Sephardic Jewish. Let's see what that. Okay, maybe it is. This is. Yeah, this is family tree DNA. Okay. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, everybody. I'm sure so many of you are sitting there like, oh my gosh, what an idiot. All right. Tell me, Jen, 5.3% West Africa, Ghana, Nigeria, 5.6% Maghreb, 33.8% Iberian, Portugal, 26.6% Italian, 18.2% Western Europe, France, and Switzerland, 4.8% British Isles, 5.7% Native American, Central and South. And then the last of it, and then the documental is what they actually know based on the document. So my or family tree DNA, less than 2% Western Lake Victoria Basin, less than 1% Southern Congo Basin, less than 4% Maghreb and Egypt, less than 2% Sephardic Jewish, 55% Iberian Peninsula, 4% Italian Peninsula, 14% Ireland, 13% Central Europe, 3% Scandinavia, 3% West Slavic, 2% Amerindian, Central and South Mexico, 1% Amerindian Andes and Caribbean, less than 1% Amerindian Central American. And then for the documental information, 6.3% uh, Sub-Saharan African, um, I guess unknown, 25% Portugal, 13.3% Italian, 0.8% French Swiss. Okay, I think I see what they're doing. 1.6% Brazilian. So that's really cool. And I like the way that they color coded it. I mean, this is really cool. Um, honestly, this is the type of thing that would be like a fun uh, tool to have in the sense of like having it where people can link somehow their results from the different sites to have a chart made up just like this. Because it is really cool how it's like broken down by how they did the colors and kind of, you know, it's hard to keep it all 
together because you can see how you know the way you define certain populations groups is going to change it differently you know over here with you know with so much less oh wait there we go over here is so much less iberian in my heritage than the iberian in genera then the north african sort of representation is a bit higher over here and then the um italy on um my heritage is way way more oh that should have been that should have been my first clue that this wasn't my heritage <laughs> so but yeah this is this is really cool um let's see i just uploaded my test from ancestry to my heritage and got 7.7 .7 iberian you know i was like huh lol i have nothing like that in my ancestry results yeah that's very interesting the one thing i always consider with the iberian is the north african connection and the italian connection so if you do have north african or italian roots that could be where it, it's connecting to but 7.7 <coughs> percent is definitely a significant uh reading um uh, thank you rosie you're not an idiot happens to all of us yeah i guess i am human or so my DNA test tells me. Um, let's see. I was surprised with Iberian in my husband's results until I did some heavy-duty research and found out that his Canadian third great-grandmother, married to an Irishman, was actually from Gibraltar. Very interesting. It certainly makes sense, you know, with the with the connection between Gibraltar, England, and Canada. Um, that, you know. Yeah, but I guess... I guess, did they just, did she, do you, have you traced it back further in Gibraltar to find that it's not just like, you know, British people living in Gibraltar, but actually from Gibraltar sort of, or, you know, uh, Gina says have to leave, but hopefully we'll be back in five minutes. It's good to leave near work, <laughs> live near work. Okay. Well, hopefully you'll be back in time. I'm, uh, only been going for, one of that, I guess, uh, 40 something minutes now. Um, uh, thank you, Catherine. I'll be, be sure to check the message. Uh, yeah, I need to read up on Ancestry's white papers because I'm very curious how accurate the Sardinian they're pinging for me is. Yeah, Sardinian's an interesting one. Okay, so we are going to... Reviewed, apply. This post was reviewed during the professional. Oh, wait, no. Do I still have it? Yay! <laughs> okay. So now there was one that I thought I saw that was, was like, oh, that'd be great to mention. Was it this one? Okay, I'm not sure if it's this one. But we'll do this one anyway because I pulled it up. Um, okay, surname research. Adding my admixture just for reference. And there we go. Um, my main question is about surname research. I am from Peru and I have a, a pretty high indigenous percentage. The other percentages are typical for people of Spanish descent. The only thing I'm curious about is the 1% Irish. I have pretty typical indigenous Spanish last names in my tree, but I want to know where this 1% Irish comes from. It's been there through every update since I took the test a couple years ago. Excuse me. Looking through my tree, there's only one last name that it could even maybe be from. What are your guys' opinions on surname research for last names that are vastly distinct from other last names in your tree? I want to hear people's experiences. Um, and then Enrique3D, who we just saw their post before. So funny. Uh, I think Irish could be a misread of northern iberian dna there's some kind there's some kind of strong celtic roots in portugal galicia asturias etc 
Um, and really interesting. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's certainly possible. That is something to consider is the ties there. Um, it's certainly interesting that it's something that's sticking through the updates. Um, unfortunately with ancestry changing a lot of things right now, if you don't have a uh, ancestry membership, it's going to be really hard to dive into this, unfortunately. Um, but the thing that I would start doing is really looking at matches and seeing, can I find any other matches with significant amounts of Irish? It doesn't necessarily be, have to be all Irish, although that'd be kind of the preference in a sense. But if you can find people that are DNA matches to you where they have a good amount of Irish and then everything else they have maybe doesn't make any sense with your matches. So, you know, obviously you have indigenous Americas, Bolivian and Peru and Spanish and Basque, Senegal, North Africa, Jewish, Ireland. So, if you do find matches like that, then you might be able to figure it out. Um, the other thing is having other me family members test, most especially older generation family members, because, you know, for one, if you have your parents test and then both parents test, and you see both of them are getting 1% Ireland. There's that pot. There is that possibility that, you know, you live in an area in Peru where, you know, hundreds of years ago, there were like, you know, there was a boat of Irish people that landed and settled and they ended up, you know, mixing with the population. And now because of that, everyone in this little region of Peru may have this Irish ancestry sort of thing. I don't know if that's the case. I'm just kind of, you know, hypothesizing here. Um, but, you know, it, there could be different things going on like that, um, you know, along with this consideration of the connections between uh, Northern Iberian and, um, you know, Portugal or, you know, yeah, <laughs> not, not Portugal, but yeah, all of, all the connections between, uh, the British Isles and, uh, Iberia. Um, let's see. And, uh, if anyone has any experiences, I'm going to see what chat says. Uh, Oh, Donna followed up on what she said before. Her family had been in Gibraltar for at least a couple of generations, all with Spanish, Portuguese surnames. He was in the British military. Okay, so probably one of those military local connections sort of thing. Um, yeah, let's see. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, there, there are a few possibilities here with that uh, Irish reading. And um, I'd be interested too to, or if I was in your your position, I would want to see some other admixtures to see if maybe they're getting it as well, um, because it could just be that even though it's stuck through the updates, it might just be kind of a, you know an issue with Ancestry's algorithm that it just keeps coming out Irish. But then when you use all the other sites, it doesn't come out Irish at all. And then that could be an indication that what Enrique 3D is saying is possibly along the, you know, that's where it is. Um, so hopefully, hopefully that was helpful. Uh, yeah. So, okay. Hmm flying through questions here we haven't even done an hour yet we're at 48 minutes so let's do since we're at 48 minutes let's see if we can find some old stuff help out some people that have been waiting a long time very possibly already have their answers so let's see let's see how this one is okay Oh, John asked, how many questions have you got left to answer? Hundreds, hundreds. Um, right before I started doing the live streams, I I spent a day where I went, I lined them up all newest to oldest. And I went as far back. As, like originally I was going by the oldest questions and doing those and then doing a few here and there that were newer, that were a bit of interest, you know, had a little bit more interesting stuff to it because a lot of the questions are the same thing of here's my results why am i getting this and it's just well it's complicated <laughs> sort of answers um so i know when i last checked it was like 200 or 300 or something like that uh so yeah it's a lot um i, I need to blow my nose <laughs> let 
the temperature keeps changing around here up and down it just wrecks my allergies so all right Ibrahim Rahim 12 from two years ago. Let's see. Does it show exactly two years? May 19th, 2022. So not quite two years, but close. Here are my results on Ancestry. Just updated. And 23andMe. My parents are both from the Caribbean, St. Lucia and St. Kitts. Any insights into how I can track down my family? Also, how do I find out what brought my Euro ancestors to the Caribbean to begin with? So many questions. So uh, we've got some interesting stuff down here. I guess we'll go and read that, but let's take a look at what we have photo-wise. So here we have the ancestry results. We have 21% Nigerian, 21% Portuguese, and specifically getting the community Madeira. We have 17% England and Northwestern Europe, 8% Cameroon, Congo, and Western Bantu peoples, 7% Benin and Togo, 6% France, 5% Ireland, 3% Mali, 3% Ivory Coast and Ghana, 3% Basque, 2% Senegal, 2% Scotland, 1% North African, and 1% Indigenous Puerto Rican. So lots and lots of stuff. Then here we're getting the 23 and Me results. And, oh, we get a pick too. So this is uh, Ibrahim Rahim. So Southern European, or 56.9% European, broken down to 39.5% Southern European, which is then Spanish, Portuguese, 38.2%. And here we have Madeira at the top again. Uh, broadly Southern European, 1.3%. Northwestern European, 16%. Broken down British and Irish, 107 Broadly Northwestern, 53 And then just 1.4 broadly. Then we have the Sub-Saharan at 41.4%, which let me see here. Yeah, I guess that probably would add up to just under 50% or so uh, with all the different African readings from Ancestry. Um, so West African mostly, 38.1%, and then 2.8% Congolese in Southern East Africa. And then those two are broken down as Nigerian, 27.3%, Ghanaian, Liberian, and Syria, Leonian, 5 point, uh, 5%, Senegambian and Guinean, one percent 7%, broadly West African, 4.1%. And then for the Congolese and Southern East African, Angolan and Congolese, and then Southern East African, 0.4%. Um, and then beyond that, oh, it's broken down even more with the Congolese part. So broadly Congolese and Southern, 03 0.2% Northern East African, which is Sudanese and 0.3% broadly Sub-Saharan. And then we get a little bit of the East Asian Native American at 0.7%. And then just a whole lot of trace stuff. And then Caribbean, St. Lucia. Um, so fairly similar in a sense, but somewhat different in the sub-regional breakdowns. But pretty, you know, 21% Portuguese compared to 38.2%. Whereas um, with this, you're also getting the 6% French and then 17% England and Northwestern Europe, whereas here it's only the 16%. So probably kind of getting that mix, you know, each site is slightly defining those differently. Um, so interesting. And now the last part, just a, another photo of Ibrahim <clears throat> in... Uh, no, I don't think that. I doubt that. I, that doesn't look like the Caribbean. <laughs> um, but, okay, so. Ah, thank you. I'm very happy that you enjoy the reactions. Let's give the post an upvote for that. Um, let's see what Fit Minimum says. Your Portuguese ancestry must be fairly recent, possibly after 1800, for you to get the exact region from both services. I've seen Latin Americans with 60-plus percent Iberian get no regions. You may be able to find a paper trail with some searching might. Yeah. For starters, ask your family and research on family search and ancestry on 23andMe. Check your close Portuguese descent matches in their trees and note their surnames and where their direct ancestors are located. Same on ancestry DNA. I don't know what your match situation on ancestry and 23andMe looks like in terms of where they're located, but California, Canada, Florida, Hawaii, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, all have Lucifone diaspora. 
entering those in the location search bar and ancestry sure to turn up more results. Interesting. So it seems like fit minimum has uh, direct uh, experience with St. Lucie and ancestry. Uh, all the above have Azorian descended peoples. Rhode Island, Rhode Island has Cape Verdeans and a lot of Portuguese as well. Uh, they didn't say that. I'm saying that. <laughs> Florida Brazilians. I know all this because I have matches in all the above. I'm Puerto Rican and Dominican. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. They are very familiar with this. Also, upload your kit to my heritage and or GenieNet. GenieNet no longer allows uploads, unfortunately. Um, the former has Brazilians and Portuguese along with expats across Europe. GenieNet has Portuguese and Portuguese descended people, mostly in France. There's lots of options to find DNA relatives with searchable trees. Just takes time and patience and luck. That's a great response all across the board. Um, OP responded, thanks for the assistance. Great observation. My grandma's grandparents were all from Madeira and came over sometime in the 1860s and 1870s. So second great grandparents. The many fourth cousin DNA matches confirm she is from Madeira and we've been able to narrow it further to a town outside of Fun Funchal, uh, Funchal because all the cases where relatives have a family tree going back more than 100 years all the last names match up perfectly, which is exactly what you're looking for. And I imagine with ancestry through lines, that made that easy. Um, what confuses me is everything else. No clue, for example, why I would be related to so many Irish British people, or even people with Jewish ancestry, some of whom do not appear to have DNA pointing to where my ancestors are from. Many mysteries here, but fascinating at the same time. I think we all know, or a lot of us in here know uh, some of the, answers to that which i'm going to keep reading through this i just want to let me check chat real quick um oh yeah there's been a few questions while i've been going over this uh, let's see ah okay john tyner says yes i remember hearing about irish connections to south america I believe there was a Lynch connection there and some other Irish connections. One of mine went to Argentina. Interesting. Um, Dennis Lund says, my dad's patrilineal heritage was always assumed to be Norwegian. Found out we actually got some indigenous Northern European that 23andMe misread as Korean and Central Asian. Very interesting. Um, okay, let's through. Um, ah, interesting. That's where Cristiano Ronaldo's from. Um, okay, how to pronounce it? Nasal U, C H equals sh. Final I can be W. So an IPA. So fusha. 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 Do you just skip the N? Is the N silent? Interesting. All right. Continuing with this, I believe the British had control of both your family's island nations for long stretches. There could have been consensual relations or none. Also keep in mind that the Royal Navy and British privateers had been in the Caribbean since the 1500s, well before they had colonies. I say this because it appears that your roots in the region are colonial, according to your Native American ancestry. Your Jewish ancestor could be Sephardi through a distant ancestor from the Netherlands and Tillis. I wouldn't necessarily say it's going to be through um, any of the Dutch colonies where there were Sephardic um, uh, communities. It's possible, but it's also just very possible with the Madeira connection of having distant Jewish ancestry that all Iberians get um, because of the Inquisition. But, but many mysteries indeed. Caribbean ancestry and history are fascinating and complicated. It's cool that you shared and hope Jared, our esteemed host, can give you some insights. Um, let me see. I gave, you know, let's give some up, more upvotes over here. Um, some more information. My mom is St. Lucian, but both her parents are half French. My grandma's French side comes from her mom's dad, fairly recently arrived during the British colonial area. Honestly, French can be misread as uh, some uh, as uh, British and Irish because of the Northwestern connection. And we can basically kind of see that here where England, Northwestern Europe, 17%. 6% France, but then over here, well, where's the French? It's lumped in somewhere probably with Northwestern Europe, British and Irish, 
in the Southern European. So it doesn't necessarily mean that through the French ancestry, they're going to be British, could just be basically you look at where your ancestors were living and they were living in France, but they just happen to share so much DNA with people that ended up in Britain that the sites haven't been able to figure that out quite distinctly yet. Um, although it is it also very possible that you do have British ancestry uh, within the past few hundred years. Okay. Um, however, my grandpa's French ancestors are very well documented and we can trace his line on many branches back to the 1700s, some all the way back to France. I can see no evidence of anyone being British or Irish, which is why all the British and Irish relatives are surprising. In addition, all sorts of Americans with detailed family trees, but no French surnames or Caribbean origins. Um, and then Fit Minimum says, I have similar matches. I have zero Anglos in my family tree, but have 400 matches with white Americans on Ancestry and hundreds more on Gedmatch, my heritage, etc. Are you British? Are your British Irish matches distant? Because distant matches. Matches in the eight cents a Morgan and 20 cents a Morgan range can be anywhere from 500 to a thousand years old. I wouldn't necessarily go that far. I'd say probably, I mean, a thousand years, that's a little really on the distance side. Usually 500, 600 years back is the farthest that a lot of genealogists say you can confidently go with matching on autosomal. And even that's kind of pretty, pretty far back. I mean, at, usually, even when we're talking about trying to do autosomal DNA results for ancestry from the 1700s, you're looking at very low amounts of shared DNA. Um, so yeah, so not a hundred percent agreeing there in that sense of could be anywhere 500, a thousand years, but I do agree with the overall sentiment of if all these matches you're looking at are really small amounts of readings, it's going to be really distant matches where it's really just your side of the family hundreds of years ago go went to the Caribbean, their side of the family went elsewhere. Um, and I have the exact same thing in my Sephardic family because I have my Dutch line, my Nunes Vaz line traces back to the, through the Amsterdam to the 1600s in Livorno. But through Y-DNA, we know for a fact that we have multiple lines of the family in Jamaica, Curacao, Venezuela, Suriname, so a mixture of South America and the Caribbean. And we know that they are relatives to each other through Y-DNA, but autosomally, we aren't matching. And from the Y-DNA, it seems to me that the connection is pro probably right around that 1700, or right around the 17th century uh, connection for us or even closer. Like from what I've found, I actually think that I know where some of these lines may be descending from, and it would actually mean that our connections in the 1700s, but we're not going to see any of those autosomal connections because it's so distant. Um, so yeah, but okay. Uh, continuing, I'm kind of fortunate that I have a few matches on Ancestry's through line feature that are eight to seven centimorgans, and all of those are six cousins, which means that I'm matching them via an ancestor born in the late 1700s. So exactly what I'm talking about right now. Uh, so kind of, they're kind of not, not yeah, I mean, I, I, I probably shouldn't harp too much on that. That's not a big deal, but I just, you know, a lot of genealogists will even say that these tests are really only good to the past 300 years, but I like to say about 500 because it really, it can vary. Um, it's just once you get past 300 years, your confidence that you'll be descending, getting DNA from those drops quite significantly. Um, okay, all those matches are Puerto Rican, though. I can't account for any of the deep ancestry on my Dominican side. Okay, um, thanks for the clarification. I didn't realize an 8 cent to Morgan, a 20 cent to Morgan was that far back. Also didn't realize you were also Caribbean. I have a few Brits and Irish who are fourth cousins. I reached out to them, but they told me that they they have no roots in the Caribbean, so I'm guessing they must have had relatives who moved into, aka colonized the region. Yeah, that's probably, probably what happened. So... Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad I, I went back and uh, chose this one. This was a, a great question to answer. And this has been two years since. So I don't know if Ibrahim is going to be still watching or not. I know, you know, people go in and out of watching different YouTubers um, or even if he kept up with uh, building their, his family tree. But um, <clears throat> hopefully a lot of these answers may uh, be a bit more or a lot of these questions may be a bit more answered already for, for them. So, <clears throat> yeah. 
blah, 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 blah. my allergies jeez oh i need to get <laughs> if my parents are watching when i come to pick up the dogs today if you have any tissues i need to pick up some tissue boxes <laughs> Okay, so let's see chat. Oh, not much chat in the last few. So, all right, well, I'm going to put that review, and I think that I'm going to have that be the last one. It actually kind of, all right, let's reload. One of the weird, well, I, I like the old view of Reddit a lot, and I've found that, at least for me, it always feels like it has a, a really hard time loading everything in the new you so <laughs> okay all right let me actually look at chat now all right ah so the final sub syllable rhymes with how so it'd be fu how fu shao fu shao Okay. So is it, it's not like the C like in Curacao, is it? Like the, you know, the C, the C little squiggle underneath. <laughs> um, ah, Lucille, welcome. Uh, thank you for joining. Um, catching, catching the last few minutes of it. So <laughs> uh, there we go. Uh, Maven, professional genealogist reacts to allergens yeah that's uh that's my whole life my entire life has been that uh thank you thank you uh there i go so and then karma says unfortunately not many stuck men oh okay you were responding to somebody else so um and no the ch is sh sh as in ship so fu shao yeah this yeah okay is just regular s yeah okay that i wasn't sure but i know you know i know with in terms of how Americans, not just, I say Americans, but North American and South Americans pronounce a lot of um, Spanish and Portuguese words. The difference between the way the Spanish and Portuguese actually pronounce it is the lisp sort of thing. Um, Cause I, you know, I, I did grow up uh, speaking Spanish. Um, my first language, my first language was Spanish. I don't speak it fluently anymore. I do speak it a little bit, uh, just barely enough to get by. When I was working in kitchens as a as a chef, uh, I knew it a lot better. But it was mostly kitchen Spanish, and it was you know a lot of ways, <laughs> you know, <laughs> just different. You know, a lot of you know, yo necesito uh, pollo away, or you know, papas fritas uh, <laughs> walking in, or you know, weird stuff like that, like la cocina, eh? So yeah, but um, yeah. I, because I kind of have a weird relationship with Spanish and English, I can kind of hear the differences of accents, I think a bit better than most English speakers. Um, and so whenever I hear someone from Spain and Portugal actually speaking Spanish or Portuguese, it sounds so different to me than like someone from the Americas. Um, so, yeah, I, I, so I wasn't sure if that was kind of part of it like you know they say curacao here but in spain they call it curacao like i know in, in my family the you know our family name is nunes vaz my mom's side of the family and a lot of the family say the proper way to pronounce it is nunes vaz nunes vaz so but like it's i can't do the lisp with it nunes nunes vaz yeah so interesting um Okay, let's let's close this out. And yeah, let me just uh, see. Um, uh, I learned kitchen Serbo Croatian, all the swear words, a few food words. Yeah, that's that when I was trying to think of stuff to say right now, I was like, okay, no, I can't say that, can't say that. <laughs> um, okay, question if I may. I believe you have Sephardic ancestry too. So are you in or have you been in contact with Ladino too? So Ladino being the language of Eastern European Sephardim, not all Sephardim. Um, so yeah, linguist here. So I'm always curious about languages. Yeah, Ladino, the languages of Sephardic Jews is very interesting because 
there's multiple ways of diaspora of Sephardic Jews. I know everyone always lumps up Ashkenazi and then Sephardi and Mizrahi. But when you look at all of those, there's specific um, waves within each of those as well. So for Sephardic Jews, there's three main waves. There's the Eastern Sephardic wave, which really starts, they start leaving Iberia in the 1300s before the Reconquista is even complete, um, especially in 1391. Um, there was a huge amount of people that left and going all the way to 1492 and after, but the majority of the wave was pre-1492 and they went to areas of the Ottoman Empire. Um, so present day Greece and Turkey and uh, Jordan and Israel and, you know, kind of a lot of those areas. Um, then you also had after that around 1492, um, 1493 or not 1493, more 1491, 1492 with the with the fall of Granada. You have the North African wave where they're basically these are all the Jews within the, you know, you have four months to leave or convert or die if you don't do either of those in four months. And so a lot of those go right across, um, you know, the sea to North Africa, settling in, you know, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia. Um, and then the third wave, the Western Sephardic wave, they're the ones that leave Spain to Portugal because Portugal didn't have an inquisition yet. And then later Portugal did enact an inquisition because they wanted to marry between their crowns. And when Portugal enacted their inquisition, this was actually much harsher than the Spanish one because there wasn't really even an option to leave. Um, so a lot of those Jews were forcibly converted and then had to secretly escape in a sense over the following centuries. And they end up in a lot of areas in Western Europe and they're known as the Western Sephardic diaspora. So they, these communities end up in Amsterdam, Livorno, Italy, Hamburg, Bayonne, and Bordeaux, France, um, London, and then as well, a lot of the Caribbean islands, especially the ones associated with the Dutch. So while the Dutch were in Brazil, there was a community in Recife, Brazil. There was Curaçao, Jamaica, uh, St. Thomas, um, and elsewhere. And then also in, in the U.S., there were Sephardic, you know, that, that's part of the Western Sephardic world. And so breaking down those three Sephardic waves with the Western Sephardic wave, which I descend from, those communities tried to keep it pure Portuguese, basically. Um, and actually, I'll pull up, uh, pull up some documents from that community um, in the Amsterdam archives. So you can see, and the, the Western Sephardic Jews, they named themselves La Nacial, the, the nation, uh, specifically the nation of Portuguese Jews um, or the nation of Hebrew Jews, or they, they, they go by various names. I have, no, I'm not going to try to reach those books over there, but they have some various books. Oh, I, of course, I'm not sharing my screen. That would kind of help, wouldn't it, people? Um, there we go. Yeah, that one. Okay, so this is the Amsterdam Archive and these are the records of the Portuguese Jewish community of Amsterdam. So Portuguese Israelite Clement. Um, and then just pulling up, we'll pull up some stuff that I always love to pull up. So these books here, these are the Eskimot books. Um, this book right here, for anyone who's familiar with Baruch Spinoza, the harem for Baruch Spinoza is in this book. This is a decision book of the community of the Portuguese Jewish community of Amsterdam. And it is written in Portuguese. So the um, Ladino and Judeo Spanish and a lot of those languages that you're asking about relate to the Eastern Sephardic Jews. And this is where I think for a lot of linguists, it gets really interesting because um, you know, a lot of people kind of think, oh, this was, you know, all Sephardic Jews, but no, it was a very specific set. And so, you know, with the Western Sephardic Jews, like if you look at the London archives for Bevis Marx, they have very similar, you know, it's written in Portuguese. In fact, let's see if I can uh, pull that up. Bevis Marx. Um, because there is a site 
named after Anasiao Hebraica, exploring the Portuguese Hebrew nation. Oh, you all can't <laughs> you all can't see that. Hold on. Uh, buh, 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 buh. So right up here, exploring the Portuguese Hebrew nation. And so we can just browse and just look at an, an account book. So this is in London. Um, I, well, this is an account book, so there might not be as much writing. It might just be more lists of names. Okay, so this is so this is actually so you can see this this is the London Portuguese Jewish community, and they are also writing in Portuguese. Now I don't know of any records uh, for Eastern Sephardim to look further into the whole Ladino thing. And actually, um, one of my really good friends in genealogy, Michael Waz, who descends from both Eastern and Western Sephardim, uh, does know a, a lot more about this stuff. So because I have West Eastern Sephardic ancestry. I've never really looked that deep into this kind of stuff. Um, let's see, just for fun. I know it's like this. Just for fun, because I want to, because I have this book pulled up. We're going to pull up the the harem for Baruch Spinoza. Let's see, I think it's 5416. I think so. And you all right now, you're getting this view of me sitting like this with my finger against my mouth, clicking through pages. This is like 90% of what my genealogy looks like is clicking through index records like this. But here, right here, nota the her oh, come on, come in the focus. There we go. Nota the harem que de publico da Theba and I. Uh, yeah, Contra Baruch Espinoza. Uh, so this is this is the Jewish community of Amsterdam giving a harem to Baruch Spinoza. Um, very, very famous uh, thing. And in fact, let's see, Baruch Spinoza, I think on the Wikipedia page. Uh, let's see. expulsion from the jewish community oh look here's a here's a photo of it so here's a photo of the book and here's the digitized record so oh wait where yeah there we go um but i think they have yeah i'm not sure yeah but just just interesting so yeah yeah ladino is much more uh eastern Fardom, and basically it developed, I think, um, a little bit later, but I'm not 100% sure. Uh, let's see. Would the Jesuits have a link to any of the Jewish lines? I, I honestly do not know. I don't know. Um, do you have any advice on researching orphan or unknown parentage ancestors? I mean, the, the number one thing is nowadays DNA testing. That's often a uh, an, an, a great way to go. But obviously there's a lot of people who aren't comfortable with DNA testing. And if that is the case, there are other ways you can go about it. Um, you know, the number one thing with orphan research is finding out what orphanage or they call them asylum, you know, depending on where you were, there's different names. I know nowadays it has weird connotations with certain names, but you just need to find out where were they living, what orphanage, whatever. And then you need to find out, are there any records or anything associated with that that you can find? Um, sometimes it's also a matter of doing what I like to think of as kind of unknown fan research. So fan meaning friends, associates, and neighbors. Um, but by unknown fan research, it's basically researching people associated with something that's associated with your ancestry. So in this case, let's say you find the orphanage that your ancestor, whoever you're researching was in, but you can't find any records of that. Well, what you can do is try to see if there's any diaries or writings or any testimonials of some sort from people who are also in that orphanage around the same time, or even if not at the same time, just 
kind of similar time periods to get an idea of what life was like and possibly even lead you to other possible routes of research. Um, because you just never know who might be holding what records on some institution that, you know, when they went under, whoever took a hold of their records, now those records are available there. Um, but DNA testing is really, that's really one of the best routes to go these days, because even when you are dealing with re records from orphanages or, you know, with unknown parentage cases, often the goal is to try to find a true birth certificate or something. Even then, there's always that question of, were the parents or whoever wrote that information and giving correct information. Um, uh, contra, if that's Spanish, then it's a plea of one person against another. Contra against. It's Portuguese, so, um, you know, against Baruch Spinoza. Uh, thank you for such a detailed answer. It was, it was very enlightening. I learned a lot. Glad, I'm glad that was very helpful, and I... Um, let me see if I can even point you to uh, somebody who is very knowledgeable about this stuff. Um, and that would be Judith Silver, who's really more into the ethnomusicology, I believe, of uh, Sephardic Jewish ancestry. Uh, here's her page. Um I don't know how in depth she knows necessarily, uh, but she's, um, I know, I, I think she's pretty knowledgeable about Ladino. So she may be a good place to look, but um, yeah. And yes, is that a map of ancestor Amsterdam? Yes, it is a map of Amsterdam. Um, and where my ancestors lived was, wait, no, uh, uh, like kind of hear it. I mean, they lived along Kirkstrat, Kirkstrat, <laughs> Church Street, Kirkstrat, New Kirkstrat. If anyone's, uh, if if I have any of my Dutchies in here, I'm sure you're all laughing. You know, mein <laughs> Uh Why a lot of people in North African and Middle Eastern often get 100% North African and West Asian, usually in 23 and Me. Um. It's probably just the way that they have their algorithm designed. Um, I guess I, I haven't dealt a whole lot with people directly from North Africa in the Middle East taking 23andMe tests. Um, but that would kind of be my guess is that it's basically just, you know, the population groups that they do have to represent that aren't very nuanced. And so it may just be very, you know, they're lumping a lot of stuff up into just one reading. And so you get these big readings um yeah <laughs> the perks of knowing phrases in several languages yeah when i was uh, in high school i actually took latin for my my language and uh it's been kind of helpful in the sense that learning and reading through records it's actually really easy to kind of figure stuff out even with cyrillic once i was able to start phonetically reading cyrillic it was all of a sudden it was like, oh, wow, you can really kind of get a sense of a lot of stuff. So cool. All right. Well, I think with that, I'm hitting just under an hour and a half. So I only really wanted to do a little over an hour. So I'm doing a little longer than that, but I'm going to call it here. Thank you so much to everybody who jumped into the, the, the stream today. I know we started a little later than usual, but uh, hopefully we still had a lot of fun doing this. And I got to show off a little bit of my favorite stuff with my Amsterdam uh, Portuguese Jewish community archives and all of that. Um, so still trying to figure out what I'm going to do on Friday stream. I kind of am thinking of something a little different than doing a celebrity family tree because I've done a bunch of those in a row. So might do another ranking tier list. I know there's a uh, genealogy TV show ranking tier list. So maybe I'll do that. Um, but yeah, I guess, uh, we'll, we'll have to see. So hopefully I'll see a bunch of you on Friday, but if not, hopefully you'll have a wonderful rest of your week and hopefully none of you are having to deal with allergy stuff like me. Um, but have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your night or day wherever you are. Bye everybody. <laughs>